Good morning, my friends, and welcome to Sunday morning worship at the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. I'm your guest preacher today, Jenny McCready, and I'm so blessed to be able to share worship with you on this summer morning. Like Reverend John, he attended Meadville Lombard Theological School, one of our Unitarian Universalist identity schools, and I do too except I'm completing my degree this next year in the comfort and safety of my home office, whereas Reverend John actually had to go to Chicago. I'll be leading worship this week and next week, and I'm so glad you could join us, whether you're in New Mexico or wherever the internet reaches you this morning. This is an important time for people of faith to continue to reach out to each other in all the safe and socially distant ways that are still available to us. Our sense of belonging and community is part of what will help us get through these unsettling times and find our hope and our courage. This morning, I'd like to call us into a space of worship with the words of the Unitarian Universalist minister, Victoria Safford. She writes, unlike almost every other thing we do with purpose, Worship makes nothing, accomplishes nothing, sells nothing, yields nothing. It is its own end. In our liberal communion, worship has no direct object. Verb is intransitive. We don't worship any single thing, but draw instead upon the meaning of the old English word we earth be, to consider that which is of worth that which is worthy. We remember what has worth once a week for a little time together. To honor what is worthy of honor, to notice what is worthy of notice, free of the losses and sorrows that are worthy of our tears, tell stories and sing about, to celebrate and draw closer to, to be more mindful of what matters. To name in the clearest possible language with the best possible music and the deepest possible silence, a few significant things. If you've got a chalice at home and you'd like to join me in lighting your chalice, we join tens of thousands of Unitarian Universalists in North America and all over the world in this ritual. <laughs> Come, let us worship together. Greetings, and welcome to the online worship services of the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. My name is Sue Watts, and I'm a worship associate with the church. Our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, is taking a brief respite from his sermon duties. 
It is our hope that during this time of upheaval and uncertainty, that you're hanging in there with courage and strength, with patience, and hopefully with a bit of humor. As Unitarian Universalists, we look to the high places of the world for sources of inspiration while keeping our feet firmly planted on the ground as we seek to build communities of greater justice and compassion. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are in your journey, you're welcome here. If you're watching the Sunday service on Sunday morning, uh, we invite you to join our Zoom coffee hour that will be held at 11 o'clock following this service. For other opportunities to connect throughout the week, you could check out our website, our Facebook page, or email announcements. Whether you are visiting us for the first time or have been part of this congregation for years, may this time we set apart from our everyday concerns, help us to see the holy in ourselves, in others, and the world around us. You've already met Jenny McCready, our special speaker for the day. She is the intern minister of the Jefferson Unitarian Church in Golden, Colorado. She'll be entering her final year of seminary at the Meadville Lombard Theological School um, and is a Colorado native. She's also the mother of five children aged seven through 20. Her previous incarnations include horse carriage driver, uh, legal assistant, and um, an eco-villager. She brings her passions for social justice and environmentally sustainable living to our pulpit today. Jenny, we're glad you're here. We will begin with a moment of shared silence. From the events of our lives come the songs of our hearts. Some are heart songs of grief and sorrow, some of joy and hope. Whether spoken aloud, written down, whispered into the wind, or held in the silence of our heart, all are a precious part of our lives and the journey that we share. So let us take a moment now as two small candles burn in our sanctuary, to bring to our minds and hearts whatever joys and sorrows we carry with us this day. In the midst of national trauma and personal struggles, anxiety, anger, fear, grief are all too real. And yet, a hawk over the canyon the glimpse of a comet or moonlight through the pines, the warmth of a cup of tea shared with a friend, even over Zoom. These can all remind us that love and beauty are as real as pain and loss. Sources of healing and wholeness abound, and there is a love that will never let us go. Please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of love and of life, source of our hope and our deepest joys, today we are grateful for the gift of life, for this opportunity to worship together, for our religious community. We give thanks for our faith that unites us as spiritual seekers and questioners 
as visionaries who are called to create a more just and equitable world. We come together today to find renewal and hope. Take comfort in each other and to nurture our souls with music, contemplation, exploration, and fellowship on our spiritual paths. Open our hearts to humble listening, to understanding, beauty. We thank you, Spirit, that dwells within and among us for all the ways that we are able to find meaning and strength and work for a kinder, gentler world. May this time we spend together renew us with healing and hope that we may spread the good news of our faith like dandelion seeds out into the world. Up a Creek by Nicholas Oldland. There once was a bear, a moose, and a beaver, who were the best of friends, though they often disagreed. One sunny day, the bear, the moose, and the be beaver decided to go canoeing. The moose wanted to steer, but so did the bear and the beaver. They all sat in the stern. With so much weight in the back of the canoe, it tipped and they all ended up in the water. So they decided to play rock, paper, scissors to make a decision. Rock, paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, two out of three, rock, paper, scissors. And it was decided that the moose would steer. So they all settled back into the canoe and began to paddle. What could go wrong? Well, the bear insisted on paddling port side, but the beaver and the moose also preferred the left. With everyone paddling on the same side, what do you think happened? Yep, they traveled in circles. Soon their arms grew tired, so they began to switch sides. That's when they finally began to travel in a straight line. But just as they began to make progress, they came to a stop at a beaver dam. Of course, they all had different ideas on how to get across. The beaver wanted to push the canoe. That didn't work. The moose thought they should pull the canoe. Uh, that didn't work either. Fortunately, the bear figured it out. The only way across was to carry it, and so the beaver had to hold tight. Back in the water, the bear, the moose, and the beaver settled into a rhythm. 
and started to really enjoy paddling along the river. But it wasn't long before they began to argue. Stop splashing! Keep paddling! Hungry! They argued so loudly they didn't notice the growing strength of the current or a quiet rumbling in the distance. Until it was too late, the river had turned into wild whitewater rapids, thrown sideways, underwater, through the air and everywhere, the bear, the moose, and the beaver held on for their lives. Exhausted, bruised, and wet, the three friends landed on a rock in the middle of the rapids. The moose wanted to burn the canoe to make signal fire. The bear wanted to throw the beaver to shore to get some help, but the beaver declined. The beaver figured that swimming to shore would be safer. They argued over whose plan was best well into the night. The next morning, it dawned on the bear, the moose, and the beaver that they would have to work together to make it home safely. So they climbed into their battered canoe, took a deep breath, and they ran the rapids. They twisted, they leaped, they crashed and blasted through the water. The rapids were fierce, but with the bear's powerful strokes, the moose's steady hoof, and the beaver's clever commands, they set their true course clear and straight. At last, the bear, the moose, and the beaver made it to shore. And after a much needed nap, the bear, the moose, and the beaver worked together to repair their canoe and paddles. They caught some fish, cooked lunch. Before they tucked into their meal, they all gave thanks for surviving the wildest adventure they had ever had. Rested and relaxed, the bear, the moose, and the beaver were ready to set out for home. They took a moment to pause, and after taking a long look at the raging rapids, they made a very important the decision. They decided to walk home. You know what I love about bear, moose, and beaver's relationships? In the beginning of this story, they made a whole lot of mistakes. They argued, and yes, they were even unkind at times when they got frustrated. But then they looked at their situation and tried new ways of thinking after so many other things didn't work. And at the end, after a pretty huge adventure, they took a moment to pause, maybe considering all they had gone through together, maybe so relieved to be on shore that before jumping back into the same pattern, they considered another option, walking. I wonder if there are things in our lives that we can take a look at before we move forward. Maybe there are places we can take a moment to pause, to be sure that we are going in the right direction. Maybe we are, or maybe there are other ways to get where we want to go, just like the bear, the moose, and the beaver.
Our reading this morning comes from Walida Emarisha. She's an African-American visionary poet and an artist. She writes, nature has taught me about fluid adaptability, about not only weathering storms, but using howling winds to spread seeds wide, torrential rains to nurture roots so they can grow deeper and stronger. Nature has taught me that a storm can be used to clear out branches that are dying, to let go of that which was keeping us from growing in new directions. These are the lessons we need for organizing. The only lasting truth is change. We will face social and political storms we cannot even imagine. The question becomes not just how to survive them. How do we prepare? So when we do suddenly find ourselves in the midst of an unexpected onslaught, we can capture the potential, possibilities inherent in the chaos, and write it like the dawn skimming the horizon. So back to December, my fiance Jason and I visited your church, and we really enjoyed meeting Reverend John and many of you and seeing your beautiful new sanctuary. We were looking forward to spending this week camping in New Mexico. As I planned to bring the camper and the kids and spend the week there in between leading worship today and next week, it was the perfect scheme to combine work and play, packing up the kids and enjoying summertime in one of our favorite places. But it wasn't meant to be. And right now, my friends, this spring and summer are what our reading Walida Imarisha referred to as an unexpected onslaught. We are in the midst of turbulence. Reverend Eric Banner is my teaching pastor at Jefferson Unitarian here in Colorado. And recently during a sermon, he took a jar of river water and he shook it up as a little visual aid to represent life in the middle of global unrest and uncertainty. Then he set it down and he let it settle during his sermon. And when he was done, of course, the silt was on the bottom and there was clear water on the top. It's good to remember that things will settle down again. We don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know what's gonna, what it's going to look like. 
but things will settle down again. And when they do, the water will be clear and we'll be able to see things from a new perspective. I wanted to reflect this morning on disruptions because we are all navigating this unprecedented time in world history. And we all know that disruptions can be really disorienting. It can be frustrating and frightening. And I guess that most of us have felt some of these really unpleasant and uncomfortable feelings the last few months. This pandemic and the chaos happening in the leadership of our country has been shocking and upsetting. But these turbulent times can lead us to reimagine what's possible. If we're mindful, we can ask ourselves, how can we build things differently when we have to rebuild? It's our moment to buck the status quo. There's a lot of disappointment in all the canceled events and gatherings this year. I'm personally disappointed that I have to finish seminary online because being with my colleagues and being with my congregants here in Golden, so important. And it makes me mad, you know, I'm angry. I want to like shake my fist in the air, but then I'm like, oh, who am I shaking my fist to? No point being angry at a pandemic. COVID-19 doesn't negotiate. It doesn't really care about my plans. And all of us, we don't really have a choice. Well, we don't have a choice in the matter. Epidemiologists predicted this would happen, and now it's happened. Might be feeling angry, too. And I think we're all tempted towards denial. We want to get together with our people. We want to travel. We want our kids to go back to school, most of us. Tempting to deny the risks and pretend it's safe. I want to give my mom a hug, you know, but it's not safe. And the non-negotiable power of this, the nature of this disruption is actually what carries in it an interesting power. We had to adjust to social distancing and we had to adapt to this disruption. Many of us are anxious to return to business as usual, but today I'd like us to think about this time as an opportunity not to return to business as usual. Business as usual wasn't going so well for a lot of people. It wasn't going well for the plants and the animals, the air, the oceans. It wasn't going well for people of color, people with marginalized gender identities or sexual orientations, people living in poverty or unable to work due to mental or physical illness or disabilities, or hundreds of thousands of people seeking asylum and safety in this country. Business as usual was not going so well. And even for the people on top, the ones who were doing okay, well, the people on top were the, are at the mercy of an unstable and unsustainable system. Right now, people are starting to realize that if anyone among us is oppressed, it's the detriment of all of us. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe that there is an interdependent web that holds us all together. We believe that us humans were connected to each other. And business as usual wasn't serving any of us well. As Fannie Lou Hamer told us 50 years ago, nobody's free until everybody's free. This spring and summer of disruption has been bringing people's attention to systemic racism and oppression. Finally, more folks are starting to listen to the voices from the margins crying out for justice for generations. This is a historic moment in human history. This is an awakening, even as we teeter on the edge of disaster. We might be feeling angry or afraid or in despair. But what keeps me going and what I hope for you is that you see this time, this infamous spring and summer of 2020 as a threshold, an opportunity. And while we need to acknowledge our hurts and frustrations, we also look for hope. We look for the ways that the suffering in the world can move us towards something better. You may have heard of the Lebanese American poet Khalil Gibran, he wrote, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. 
even as the stone of the fruit must break that its heart may stand in the sun, so you must know pain. So if we can be with our pain, with not knowing what's coming next, then we can be more present to our lives and to each other and even to ourselves. This is a time to be present with our faith. Unitarian Universalists are not just a liberal social club. And while we do work together for social justice, we aren't just active. We also share a liberating faith. We share a spiritual journey towards acceptance of what is. Our faith carries a message of good news. We can find meaning in the work we do. We find salvation in the work that we do. We are called to keep disrupting and rebuilding towards more justice and more love. So I have a story about how this stupid pandemic did move me forward in my formation as a minister. In the middle of March, I was planning to leave just as Sunday on March 22nd for my teaching congregation. We were preparing to welcome Reverend Mary Catherine Moore, the president of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, and I was tasked to teach the congregation the history of the UUSC. We were going to learn about Martha and Wade Still Sharp, and I got all fired up to pitch in for immigration justice. This is my jam, and I worked really hard on that service. Creating worship still takes me a long time. I'm new at it. Then, one week before that service was supposed to happen, March 15th, the world turned upside down. Suddenly, we were learning about this new unfamiliar term, social distancing, and what that would mean for our church. And we realized that services in the sanctuary with the worship team in close proximity were not safe. So my Justice Sunday service was now out of context. Our focus shifted from UU history lessons to where were we going to find food that wasn't on the shelf in the grocery store, let alone toilet paper. We were all processing and coping and adapting and learning fast about this new reality, right? You all remember, you were all there. And it became clear that the intern was going to leave the first service from home, which now seems kind of normal. I've become quite accustomed to being a minister from my walk-in closet. But back in June, that was quite a curveball to throw the rookie, right? Jefferson Unitarian Church has 800 members, and when we would live stream our services, we had several hundred people tune in as well. So it felt very vulnerable and scary to lead worship for hundreds of people, maybe thousands, from my little office. But I had to plan a new service and a new sermon, and fast. It was pretty much my worst nightmare. But there wasn't any time for fist shaking. Congregation needed us. And I was forced to adapt. I just had to get in there and give it my best shot. And here's the punchline. That service, that sermon turned out to be the best I'd done. It changed me. It forced me to be in the moment with the people. Not thinking about what I learned in theology or preaching class, but to be present with what was actually happening in real time for our congregation found my voice as a preacher because I got thrown in the deep end and I knew my mind couldn't save me. It was up to my instincts and my heart. Now, I can't say I'm glad for this disruption, but it has already taught me what's possible for all of us when things get shook up and dismantled. Then the dust settles. We're forced to tune in. We're forced to go into survival mode. And then see things from a new perspective. We've all seen the effects of upset recently. People in this country were deeply shaken as we watched George Floyd begging for his life. We all started to wake up a little more and to listen a little more to what people of color have been telling us. People's shock and their humanity softened them up a little bit. And we all became a little more open to new ideas about overhauling many of our long-standing ways of doing things. People of color right now and white allies are working to disrupt the status quo 
to tear some of the systems down so we can reimagine policing, law enforcement, and how we can serve everyone better. It's going to be messy. But disruptions like these are how we move into new ways of thinking and being. Makes me wonder what else could come from this time of unrest. We're seeing the potential for some big changes, but all those big changes are coming from small changes, individual people opening their hearts. Wondering if we've all been witnessing, if what we've all been witnessing this year has it shifted your perspective? Has it brought your attention to things you haven't noticed before, like how we speak? or unconscious prejudices and behaviors? Has this disruption made you feel vulnerable? Vulnerability is a new feeling for some people. Some of us come from a place of privilege, but for people who don't, it's a daily familiar feeling. But feeling vulnerable can help us all understand what it's like to be someone in the margins, someone who lives with insecurity and depression every day. Has this time caused you to think outside the box? Has it inspired you to reimagine what's possible for our world? Imagining a new world is the work of Unitarian Universalists. We are part of a long heritage of being disruptors and heretics, questioners. We are learners and explorers, and it's up to us to listen on the margins and to be servants of justice. This is where we can find hope. I'm of uncertainty. We are all getting shook up like a jar of mud and water, but the dust will settle. This is the painful time Khalil Gibran was referring to, the breaking of the shells that enclose our understanding. The key to kindling our faith right now and finding our hope is remembering to face the unknown with humility and curiosity. Be vulnerable enough to say, yeah, I'm scared. I don't know what's coming next. Human beings are incredibly resilient in our nature to be resilient. And just like Walida and Marisha suggested, may we capture the potential and the possibilities in the chaos. That is our calling, my friends, to be courageous and to use our disruptions to grow into our best, most mindful and creative self. May it be so. Here in this religious community, we receive gifts that nurture our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. Our offering is an opportunity to share some of those gifts with the wider world. Even though we are unable to meet in person, we continue to take online donations for our community partners. During the month of August, we invite you to make a donation to the Los Alamos Family Council. The Council provides emotional and social well-being through education, prevention, and counseling. They serve the Los Alamos County through their Counseling Center and two Youth Activity Centers. To make an online donation, please use the link that you can find in the service notes below or on your screen. You can find more information there as well. Thank you for your generosity. May what you give bring you joy.
I would have preferred to see your smiling faces this morning in the beautiful state of New Mexico. But I am so glad and grateful to have been able to share this time of worship. There are challenging times, my friends, but let's face it, life is full of difficulties and uncertainty and problems we probably won't solve in our lifetimes. We don't shy away from that. In our faith community, we don't deny or pretend that everything's okay, because we know that our strength lies in our vulnerability and our best creativity and wisdom sometimes comes from the disruptions, the chaos, from the breakdowns, painful stuff. Go into your week, keep the faith that you were made for these times. Take gentle care of yourself. It's okay if things are upside down, if the mud and the water are shook up in the jar. In the words of the ancient mystic Julian of Norwich, all will be well. All will be well again, I know. Blessed be. Hi, thank you. Thank you.